Our scripture this morning is in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, and it's in our Pew Bibles on page 892. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with his scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Everyone has a story, and everything has a story. I remember when I was younger, I got the chance to go to Gettysburg. Have any of you ever been there before? And I remember looking around all of these old buildings and all of these old uh, fields, and I thought to myself, if only trees could talk. And then I remember when Lynchy and I had the opportunity to go to Jerusalem and to see even older buildings, and to see places where Jesus would have walked, and to think to myself, if only buildings could tell stories. We are in a unique place here at First Baptist Church. We live and worship within a building that's over a hundred years old. If only buildings could tell stories, right? You know, the, this current building uh, that we were in was made uh, and commissioned in the year 1910. The church existed before then, but the, there was a problem, and it, it was a good problem. It's a problem that you don't often see, where they outgrew the building. So they had to decide it was time to tear down the old building in order to make room for a new building. And the year was 1910, and they have subsided over $14,000 for the building project. And when it was complete in 1912, it, it cost 18000 Now, how much do you think that would be today? <laughs> well, there's a good thing called Google now, <laughs> where you can type in and you can figure out what the, what the inflation rate was for that year. 
and it cost them about $485,000 that the people in El Paso wanted to raise. Now, here is the part of the story that you may not know. In 1910, when the church decided it was time to build a new building, guess what? They didn't have a pastor. Can you believe that? What does that tell you about their vision? What does that tell you about how they saw their church and how they saw their place in their community? If only buildings could tell stories. I believe that if this building could tell a story, it would tell the story of a church that was willing to take on risks. A church that was willing to break into new frontiers. A church that was so passionate about their mission that they were willing to spend $485,000 even without a pastor. I looked at our church's history and I noticed that our church does have a pattern of doing new and amazing things. In, in 1954, for an example, this church participated in something called Churches for New Frontiers. And it was a group of American Baptist churches that I believe partnered with the Home Mission Society. And they, even in 1954, they believed that the mission of God was going into a new frontier. And this church wanted to be a part of that. They were willing to risk everything. And this church was willing to even do some other risky things. Many of you might remember 1991. What happened in this church in 1991? With this church called Pastor Terry, the first woman pastor of this church, which was not without controversy, as I understand it. And then, in 2018, this church ordained a Chinese woman who's sitting here. <laughs> what a story. And those are just a few of the stories that this building could tell if only it could talk. Buildings can't speak, right? They can tell some stories. Historians are able to peel out some of the layers. But let me ask you a question. Who can tell stories? Us, right? Oh, sorry, I scared you. <laughs> we, ourselves, are the storytellers. And our story is much bigger than a building. This building represents the, the church's heart for a space for stories to be told. They believe that in this community, there was a need to tell a story. The people of this church believe that they were, they were a part of something so much bigger than themselves. And they were willing to risk everything. They knew what was important. And they knew to keep what is important, important. Situations may change. Culture is going to change. But you know, the church is still a part of the community. The church still has a witness. There are still Stories that need to be told. You know, often we, we are tempted to look at the church today and say, well, it's never been worse than this. Well, that's not true. Because in the book of Acts, we see a church in crisis. 
We see a church that has limited resources, a church that doesn't have an established structure. They did not have money that uh, that other institutes had. They were kind of out on the limb, but they were willing to list to risk everything because of that story that they believed in. If you remember in the beginning of Acts, Jesus said to the disciples, you will be my witnesses, right? And it's not just you'll be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, but he said in Samaria and to all of the parts and the ends of the known world. Well, I love how honest Acts is, because even after the day of Pentecost, guess where the disciples stayed? (laughs) They sat down in Jerusalem. They stayed there. But what was it that forced the church to go outward, to be able to tell the story to other parts? Was it, did they decide, well, we're doing such a good job here in Jerusalem, it's time to plant a church in Samaria? Was that the way it went? No. Look at your Bible for a second and look at Acts chapter 8. And it tells you the kind of situation and the kind of circumstance that the church was facing when they were going to move forward. In verse 1, it says, That day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. There was a new kind of scattering that was going on. Things were beginning to get rough in Jerusalem. And the church had to move forward under the context of stress and fear not knowing what the future would bring. But yet, the song of Psalm 27 rang in their hearts, Whom shall I fear? Whom will I be afraid? Because here's the thing about a a church that believes in the gospel. They believe that the gospel has the last word. Amen? Amen? That the persecution that they were facing did not have the last word. And the trials that every church, including our own church, face each day and each year, they themselves do not have the last word. So they pressed on. They became pioneers for the church which is basically the same way that this church was established. If you remember, this church was established in in 1858. And it was during that time that everyone was expanding out into the new frontier, right? They were expanding out west. And Illinois was still relatively a young state. And new families and new communities were being built, including El Paso. And it was the work of many missionaries, American Baptist missionaries, that made it possible for a church like this to be born. As I think about this story, my my thought goes to Philip, who is this deacon of the church, a man with the gift of sharing the gospel. And I often wonder, who are the Philips? of our own lives? Who were the people who shared their story, who shared the good news with us? For some of you, it could have been your parents. For some of you, it could have been a campus minister or a youth worker. It could have been a friend or a coworker. Whoever that Philip may be in your life, Thank God for them, amen? Thank God for them because they believed that there was a story to tell. And it was a good story. It's actually the only story that really is important. 
Because if we are to be a church that believes in reaching out, we have to know and hold on to what is important, and we have to create space for connection. Our scripture features Philip, who an angel of the Lord said, get up and go down to the south of the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza, and then Luke includes, this is the wilderness. And I wonder if Philip thought to myself, Lord, why couldn't you have sent me to Cancun? <laughs> why couldn't you send me to Hawaii, somewhere that's tropical? But that's not where the angel of the Lord sent him. The angel of the Lord sent Philip to the wilderness. And not only the wilderness, but our text in, in the Greek says at noon. Now, what is special about at noon in the desert? Hot. Very hot. Probably even, even hotter than Illinois in July. And the Lord said, go there. And he didn't tell Philip what was going to happen. What do you think was going on in Philip's mind? Lord, you're crazy. <laughs> but you know, that's the way that the Lord works. He doesn't always call us to the most comfortable and the most convenient of spaces and the most convenient of times. He brings us to God-forsaken places and God-forsaken times in order to meet God-found people. Amen? Because Philip goes, I just, I, I, I get a chuckle of how passive Philip is in the story. The angel says, go, and Philip says, okay. He goes. That is the mark of a disciple, one who is obedient to go wherever the story may need to be told, no matter how dangerous and hot it might be. So the Lord took him to a foreign land to meet a foreign man. The scripture says that this man traveling on chariot was an Ethiopian official. He was a eunuch. And you know, Ethiopians from, from Africa, they were different from a lot of the Romans and a lot of the Greeks and all of the Jewish people. They were kind of like really intriguing and, and mysterious to a lot of these people. He, he had a different color of skin. He had a different culture. He was a different place in his life. He was a person of high power and status. We gather that he is a person of great wealth. He's, in fact, traveling through chariot. And he's a trustworthy man. He's a, a man of integrity. And most importantly, he's a man who has been seeking out God. The scripture says that he was in Jerusalem and he was preparing to leave, to return back to his home country. What I find so fascinating about this is this man goes to Jerusalem, but technically speaking, he, as a Gentile, as a non-Jewish person, and as a eunuch, could not enter into the temple space. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 21 actually forbids eunuchs from entering into the sanctuary. So here, Philip is in a weird place at a weird time and meeting a different person. You know, part of reaching out is not only telling our story, but also listening to other people's story, especially when they are different. If you want to be a witness for Christ, you have to know what it means to walk in their shoes. You have to know what it means to step into another person's world. As I was uh, 
reading this text and, and thinking about the Ethiopian man, I, I was reminded that Lynchy and I actually participated in an Ethiopian worship service in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, one of Lynchy's friends in seminary was the pastor there, and we thought it'd be cool to go there and worship, and we had our own idea of what worship looked like. We were wrong. <laughs> Because, you know, here it's usually a structured hour, you know that, you know, it's, and you're out. So we begin the worship service, it's in a different language, we don't know what's going on. And the music begins playing, and it's rhythmic. And people, uh, they have been praying, they've been kneeling at the pews, uh, praying out loud to God, and then all of a sudden they stand up. And they start to dance. And then all of a sudden they begin to sing in their language. And Lindsay and I don't know what they're singing. But they're repeating it over and over again. And eventually Lindsay and I caught on and we began to sing with them. And I think we finally figured out what they're singing. And it, it was great. <laughs> but that lasted an hour. <laughs> and then the pastor got up to preach after an hour of worship. And guess how long he preached? An hour! That's right. <laughs> and Lynchy, Lynchy got a chuckle because this man, when he spoke English, he was very, you know, very confined, very proper. But then when he preached in his native language, it's like he was a whole different person. He, he just exploded. And people were celebrating and worshiping together. It was beautiful, and the, here's the, the cool thing you might want to know. It took place in an American Baptist church. <laughs> what is amazing is how accepting they were of Lynchy and I. Lynchy and I were for a change, the foreigners. <laughs> we were the ones who were different, but yet they treated us like brothers. They let us participate in their story because we might look different, we might come from different places and different languages, but we all worship the same God, the same triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord calls us to reach out to those who are different. Where are the places in our lives where we can be receptive to others and be invited into their space and share that story together? I, I was reading a book by John Perkins. He was, he's an African-American pastor who created the Christian Community Development Association the CCDA. And he tells the story about Tommy, who was uh, from Mississippi, and he was a former KKK <laughs> member. And he was, he was considered the most dangerous man of Mississippi. Until he was arrested, and it was there that he read the Gospels and had a life-changing conversion. He read those words from Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor their male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And Tommy and John became friends. One day, John was invited to speak in an audience of black students, and Tommy was with him. And to see what would happen, Johnny invited Tommy to speak to the students. And Tommy said this, God changed my heart and gave me an attitude of love toward people. And to those students, Tommy said, it is good to have a friend and understand what life is like for them. 
John, in his book, he says these, this. We've drawn some hard lines in our country today. There are racial, there are political, they are ugly, and they are wrong. If we are friends of God, and if the Spirit of God lives in our hearts, we must renounce bigotry and prejudice. We should have friends who look like every ethnicity under heaven. Why should we want to go to heaven where every tribe and every nation will be worshiping together at the feet of our God if we don't want to be friends now? That was powerful. One of the dangers of Christianity today is to fall into the Burger King syndrome. Have it your way. We often want to have it our way. We want, often want things to be comfortable and convenient. And we try to manufacture the best environment and even choose our own friends. But ultimately, we lose. We miss opportunities to grow. We miss opportunities to connect. We forget what is important. As Philip sat with the eunuch in the, in the, um, in the chariot, they shared together the message of Isaiah, where it talked about the one who was led like a sheep to the slaughter. In his humiliation, justice was denied. And who can describe his generation? I think it is so appropriate that this scripture from Isaiah 53 is used because it shows Christ's solidarity with us. That Christ suffering with us and Christ suffering for us. And it is there that the story begins, because that is not the end of the story. Philip begins telling the man the good news about Jesus. And something begins to click in this man. And I, I have a chuckle of how easy the Ethiopian man made it for Philip. Philip didn't have to ask, are you ready to make a decision for Christ? No, they came to water, and the eunuch just stops the chariot and says, hey, what's keeping me from being baptized? What would it be like if someone came into our church, and the pastor preaches the sermon, and someone says, I want to be baptized today? What would you do? Would you say, well, we better wait? No, you get the water rolling, right? Because God is at work in that person's heart and that's lives, and we see that work and we want to be a part of it. Why? Because while this building can tell stories, our stories are also God's stories, and those are the stories that matter. Those are the stories that are most important. That God is shaking up our world in order for us to reach outward to others. This week, you actually have the opportunity to reach out to people who are different. People who come from different homes, different communities, and different places in their own lives, and yet, just like the people of this church in 1912 wanted it to be a space for gathering and a space for connection. We here in 2020 have that same opportunity. And what a better way to do it, in my opinion, than having a cup of coffee <laughs> and singing and worshiping together. How can we see God at work in this space today? How can we join and participate and what stands in our way? What often holds us back? I leave you with a, a, a little parable. It's a, from a book called Songs of a Bird. And it's a story about uh, a farmer who found an eagle's egg and put it under a hen. And one day the egg hatched and the eagle emerged from it 
and the hens raise the eagle as a chicken. And so this, this eagle grew up. He grew up learning to scratch the ground for worms. He learned to chuck, you know, to cluck and make all kinds of, of noises. And one day he was out and he saw an eagle fly overhead. And he looked up and he said, what is that? And the chicken said, well, that is the king of birds. That is the bird of the sky. We are the birds of the ground because we're chickens. And so the eagle lived like a chicken and died like a chicken. Let us resist the temptation to live like chickens when we were born to be eagles. Paul says, yet whatever gains I had, these I had come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That was his story. That was the story of Philip. That was the story of this church in 1910. And that is the story that we tell today. That Christ is most important. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this example of what it means to reach out to others, to be able to tell our story and also to hear other people's stories. We thank you for the Phillips of our own lives who are willing to tell that story. Help us to be a Philip to our neighbor. Help us to be a Philip to the stranger near us. Because in that stranger, we may find a brother and a sister. We may find a son or daughter of the Most High God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.